This show is brought to you by Masada Tactical. Go to masadatactical.com or training.masadatactical.com to learn more about the offering, self-defense, self-protection, firearms, shooting, and a fully stocked gun shop. Use the code SILVERSAVAGE10 for 10% off of any class you sign up for on their website. This episode is also brought to you by Combat Iron Apparel. Go to combatironapparel.com to see their awesome shirts, t-shirts, sweatshirts, shorts, tank tops, and anything else that you can think of uh, for the tactical athlete out there. Use the code SILVERSAVAGE10 for 10% off of their products. Welcome to the Silver Savage Podcast. First ever episode and certainly first for 2022 our very first guest is Dr. Eric Nager. Dr. Nager is a physician who specializes in optimizing health, and I'm going to let him explain more about what he does and who he does it for. But some things you may want to know about Dr. Nager before we begin. Eric was the medical manager for the Pennsylvania Urban Search and Rescue Team. He's a fire surgeon for the Baltimore County Fire Department, and he was the tactical physician for the Hartford County Sheriff's Office. The guy brings a lot of experience from the medical and tactical fields and able to combine those together and really optimize the health of people in our world. So with no further ado, Dr. Eric Nager. Eric, you are our first guest. So uh, part of it because you and I are close friends outside of our work. And secondly, because I really feel that what we're going to be talking about really would resonate with our listeners. So I figured this would be a good kind of intro to what Silver Savage is all about. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then I'm going to, with your permission, share a little bit of my story and uh, that kind of factors in. So yeah, sure. Ahead. Thanks for having me. It's an honor, guys. Appreciate uh, being the first guest. So to fill you guys in a little bit on myself, uh, I was an emergency physician for probably about 25 years, uh, worked in various ERs in uh both Delaware and the Maryland area, and uh, grew up in New York, did all my schooling up there. And then uh, after med school, went down to Delaware, trained in emergency medicine, and then moved down to Baltimore, where I've been in the sort of the area ever since. Uh, in those years, gave me an opportunity to have a lot of really neat experiences, worked with the fire department and EMS, worked with USAR teams, worked as a tactical physician for the sheriff's office, and uh, most recently transitioned into functional medicine, uh, started uh, looking into that probably around 2015. I was order, always really interested in sort of health and fitness and trying to be as healthy as I could. And back then I went to a conference just to really learn a little bit more about how to be a healthier person. And when I was there, I was introduced to functional medicine, didn't know much about it, hadn't learned a lot about it in medical school and was surrounded by physicians who were practicing this. And I said, oh, I didn't really even know this was a thing. And uh, one thing led to another, ended up doing a fellowship in functional medicine. And uh, uh, functional medicine essentially is looking at the root cause of illness. It involves everything from hormone replacement therapy to gut health, thyroid, uh, and just really optimizing health. And uh, finished my fellowship, took about three years, uh, took world boards, written boards, and then went out on my own, uh, joined the group practice for a little over a year and then had the opportunity to uh, open my own practice uh, about hmm, about a year and a half ago, right at the kind of the start of the whole pandemic. And I've been practicing this ever since. So uh, you and I crossed paths, I guess, a while ago. And I guess you can fill folks in on, on that little backstory. Yeah, so you and I actually, I was trying to think about it earlier. I think you and I first met at Bet to Fila, uh, where kids go to school. And he was, we we're trying to do a walkthrough and kind of figure out active shooter preparedness. And uh, our first conversation was actually about our trucks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're trying to have my truck, yeah. And, uh, and we kind of hit it off and started hanging out then and uh, did a few uh, shooting events together, uh, some local. We brought some instructors from out of town. And actually, you and I started truly hanging out. Uh, I used you as, as a mentor. We used to meet up for breakfast, which I kind of miss and we should do again, uh, and talk about just life, uh, investments for me growing up from a business standpoint, you always were someone I look, looked up to. Um, and I think that was about the time that you started your transition into optimized health uh, medicine type thing, and you needed subjects. 
So <laughs> I volunteered. Um, I figured I get free medical exam. <laughs> uh, you know, so that was good. But uh, you know, I'll tell a little bit about my story and, and how that relates. And uh, I guess that would be a perfect segue to uh, our audience. But when you started discussing uh, testosterone levels and so forth, I actually went to my primary care physician, had him test me, and he said everything was normal. Um, then after the fact, I learned that there are different testosterone tests that can be done, and your primary care physician may not be checking the right numbers after all. But you asked me some questions. You asked me if I feel weak, and I said, no, I'm just as strong as I've ever been. If I'm sexually active, I said, yeah, all is good in that department. Uh, the only symptom I had was I was tired. I was always tired. And, and your answer was, well, you're burning the candle on both ends, which I was, still am. But I'm like, it felt different. And I'm like, let's, let's check it. And you ran the test, and my numbers came in either the single or double digits. And correct me if I'm wrong, it should be between 200 and 800. And people in our line of work should be closer to the 800, if not even higher, right? So being in the single or double digits, just you said you, you've never seen that before. And that it was... You were surprised just as much as I was. Uh, but one thing I really liked about you, and maybe you can talk about it a little more, is you're actually not a big proponent, not that you're opposed to it, but you're not pushing uh, testosterone hormonal therapy. You're trying to find out the root of what's causing my testosterone to be low to begin with. In my case, we end up doing uh, heavy metals tests, and we found that my lead uh, levels were off the chart. And once we started addressing that, my testosterone level started going back up on their own. So what are some of the different approaches that you see out there in terms of testosterone uh, levels and, and the remedies for it, I suppose? Yeah, great questions. So when we think about testosterone, okay, I mean, for, for men, this is sort of a no-brainer, right? We're, we're testosterone-driven beasts for the first part of our life. And then as we sort of transition and, you know, we're getting into 30s, 40s, 50s or older, all of a sudden we notice that some in some of us we just don't feel the way that we used to when we were younger and the question is you know what's going on why is that and it's multifactorial it's not it's not always just testosterone like there are folks who legitimately are just you know hard drivers and and they are burning the candle at birth, both ends and you know they um they may have perfectly normal testosterone levels it may just be that they're working till two o'clock in the morning and getting up at seven in the morning and they're doing that five six days a week and they're just burning themselves out. Um, and it's funny because uh, that initially was my first thought with you. You know, you're definitely a type A personality. You are a hard charger. You've got your, you know, your feet dipped in a lot of different pots. And so I thought, you know, there's no way this guy's testosterone is low. No way. And uh, this is all just, you know, work related, you know, work life balance, that kind of thing. And it's funny because I, I usually at the very beginning of my career, that was my view for all of my cops all my guys in the military and all the guys in the fire department that were coming to see me as patients. I was like, ah, there's just no way this guy is, this guy is loaded with testosterone. And little by little, I realized that I was wrong in my initial assumption. And what was happening is that, yeah, you know, definitely part of it was work-life balance, no doubt about it, but it wasn't the only thing. And it was certainly uh, manifesting with, with lower levels of testosterone. So when, when folks go for a testosterone level, a couple couple of caveats to just think about. Uh, there is, you know, there are uh, numerous ways to, to measure testosterone. There's total testosterone, free testosterone, bioavailable, but just for simplicity's sake, you know, if you just think about total testosterone as just a, you know, that, cause that's a pretty good marker about what your testosterone level is at and how you're doing. There's a big range. So if you go to like a lab, like LabCorp, their value might be from like 260 to 900. It's a really broad range. And if you go to your primary care doctor and you have your testosterone level checked and your testosterone level is 300, your doctor is going to tell you there's no problem. Your testosterone level is within normal limits. And there's a reason for that because when we go through medical school, uh, all of the lab tests that we learn about, if you are quote unquote within normal limits, then by definition, we're taught there can't be anything wrong with you. Okay. That level is fine. And that's sort of how, how, we, ma how we manifest our interpretation of these lab tests. And so functional medicine is not about, you know, being normal. It's really about being optimal. And that's really what I try to stri you know, strive for with all of my patients, because when a lab comes up with those numbers, they're basing them on tens of thousands of patients, many of whom are sick or ill. And so if you've got like an 85 year old guy in a nursing home 
and you're throwing his testosterone level in. And, you know, if you're a 30, 40 year old guy, that level is not going to be, you know, optimal for you. That's not going to be a level that you feel well and healthy at, uh, you know, and so uh, that's kind of what how you have to sort of look at this. You don't want to ever be normal with a lot of these tests. And so optimal will sort of manifest with you feeling the best that you can possibly feel. And uh, so I find when I'm looking at levels of testosterone, most men feel healthiest somewhere in the range of like five or 600 to about 900 to 1,000, okay? So definitely higher than, um, than you know, your primary care doctor might consider, you know, what is, what is normal. And that's the case for a lot of guys. They'll come in, their testosterone may, level may be in the high 200s, the low 300s, and they're manifesting with every sign and symptom of low testosterone. And yet they've gone to their doctor, the doctor checked the testosterone level, and they're like, yeah, your testosterone's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. We don't have to do anything about it. And that, and that guy is suffering, and he doesn't know why, and he can't understand why. So you bring up a good point. So you talk about people are suffering and are at suboptimal levels, right? So for the general population, again, most of our listeners, are, uh, I would argue, are in our age group, and they're probably just as hard chargers as we are. Uh, they still have to finding them, right? So what are some symptoms or signs that they can kind of start digesting and, and figure out, okay, there's something wrong that I should get checked. Uh, what are some things that they should be looking out for? Yeah, great. Great question. So the first thing is, um, you know, man will generally sense that something's just not right. You know, they feel like, you know, there's just something not right. I just feel different. I don't feel like myself. You. What's that? I told you. You did tell me. I just, <laughs> I just had to learn the lesson for myself. Hey, but um, hey, for the record, over 15 years of marriage, I feel like that every day. Just being married. <laughs> Okay, it's just office, not right. right. <laughs> we got to get you in the office, Steve, and check it out. We do. We'll, we'll talk in a second. I'll let you finish your question. Yeah. So, um, and and that's the first sort of tip off. You know, a man is just like, you know, just something is off. I just like I don't feel as productive in the gym. I'm not motivated to work out. I'm working out, but I'm just not getting the gains that I used to. Like my lean muscle mass doesn't feel where it needs to be. Uh, some guys will feel somewhat depressed or maybe sad or just not, not, you know, not overtly like they want to kill themselves or anything like that, but just like something isn't right. And they, and a lot of them, the, the, I guess the kind of the best way is they sort of lose their drive or their zest for life. All of a sudden things that meant a lot to them just aren't as meaningful anymore. And that's, you know, we all remember what we were like in our, you know, our teenage years and our twenties, you know, we were full of uh, piss and vinegar. We were ready to take on the world, you know, whatever profession, we were you know, going after, we were really into it and it meant the world to us, right? And we want to keep those feelings going forever. So when men start feeling that way, um, that's sort of a little bit of a tip off. There are some other signs that are a little more vague, you know, fatigue, falling asleep after dinner, um, uh, sort of holding on to a little bit of abdominal pouch, like a little bit of a pouch at the bottom of your abdomen, because that's where men tend to retain fat when their testosterone is low. Uh, the sort of the last thing to go for guys is libido and erectile function and sort of, you know, it's funny because when you go to your doctor, that's like one of the first things they ask, like, what's your sex drive like? How is your erectile function? Because we automatically equate that with low testosterone. But if you just think about it from an ancestral standpoint, we're meant to reproduce. Um, that's going to be one of the last things to go because we've got to spread the seed, so to speak. And so I find with men, uh, that may be the last manifestation that they experience when their testosterone has been uh, suboptimal for quite a while. All right. So, doctor, if I may jump in here, first and foremost, I probably hit every check mark there. So if you need another test subject, I'm there for you. <laughs> um, I know you and I have kind of recently gotten to know each other through Masada Tactical and through BK. And I'm essentially the Puerto Rican American version of BK. So uh, just to sum it up so you understand. Now, you talked about symptoms. Now, people in our profession that you've worked with for years, uh, military, first responders, et cetera, are there, empirically speaking, are there any outside influencers that may also affect testosterone levels that you know of? Um, I know BK's gotten very strict, you know, with making sure heavy metals are washed off our hands after a range day. You know, after he actually spoke with you and got to know you more and was uh, working on himself, you know, he brought brought that to light for me, which became a concern for me. And I've actually transitioned not just physically, but mentally and in other aspects into functional fitness. I'm actually at one of your facilities now that you oversee resilient doing physical therapy for a recent surgery. Um, and it's phenomenal. 
But from what you know empirically, are there any outside influencers like heavy metals or anything like that can also affect testosterone levels that people in our profession that are regularly exposed to can kind of mitigate somehow, you know, whether it's simply by washing our hands after a range day or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So a healthy man should be able to produce testosterone well into his 60s. You know, so the question is, why all of a sudden are all these guys in their 30s, 40s and 50s coming in with low testosterone? What the heck's going on? And more importantly, um, just about every single patient in my practice that's a cop, a fireman, or in the military has low testosterone. It's remarkable. Uh, I mean, almost to a T. Uh, you know, maybe they find their way to me that way, but but in the end, every single one of them low testosterone. And these are not old guys. These are guys, like I said, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and occasionally, I'll even have a guy in their 20s that comes to see me. So, so what's going on? What's driving all this? So what do the police department, the military, and the fire department, what do they have in common? Well, for starters, they're exposed to a lot of bad toxins, okay? So guys in the military, um, you know, it goes without saying there's just methyl, ethyl bad stuff everywhere, like the paint on the Humvees, right? It's like supposed to protect you from biotoxins. And, and it's funny because uh, I was in a Humvee that we got for the sheriff's office, and the guy that was with me was an old ranger. And he goes, yeah, why, you know, don't touch that paint. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, it causes cancer. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, what's the paint for? He's like, to protect us from bio warfare. I'm like, great. So it causes cancer, but it protects you from anthrax. So it didn't make much sense to me, but that's the military, right? So that stuff is everywhere. So guys in the military are constantly being exposed to like high explosives, explosive materials. Um, uh, they're getting exposed to lead, heavy metals, toxins on military bases. The water supply is, is contaminated to places like Lejeune. So constantly exposure to hazardous materials, fire department. Okay. What do they do after a fire overhaul, right? One of the worst times to be in a fire, they're pulling ceilings. And in most of the guys, unfortunately, just because of, you know, just because of the way the fire department is, most of them are not masked up. Okay. And they tell us, they tell you that in the fire academy. Cause like, you know, I was a firefighter for a while and that was one of the first things that they told you, you know, put the mask on. Cause that's the worst time. If you ever go into a fire and they're doing overhaul, everybody's not wearing their masks. And, and that's unfortunately pretty routine. So they're breathing in like a lot of garbage that's just liberated from a fire. Uh, more importantly, they come back to the firehouse. They've got that crap all over their boots, all over their turnout gear. Then they get it into the bunk room, they get it into the kitchen and then they bring it home, unfortunately. So they, they get exposures that are pretty high. Cops, you know, shooting, uh, lead, heavy metals. So again, all of these professions, they have the, the toxins are pretty much all over the place. Uh, fire department, the other thing is, is schedules. Sleep tends to crush testosterone if you're not getting enough of it. So we know that shift work, rotating shift work, right? You guys get enough sleep? Doc, I'm coming to see you as soon as this podcast is over. <laughs> Actually, if you're going to be at, at Resilia tomorrow, I got an appointment at 12 with Maddie. So maybe I can come <laughs> up and say hi. I'll come see you while I'm eating my lunch. We'll yeah, do I just had knee surgery, so I'm working on that. We'll do a double dipper. <laughs> but you see how this sort of is pervasive, right? So, you know, you have the shift work for the guys in the fire department, right? They'll work two on, you know, two days, two nights, and then a couple of days off, whatever the schedule, sometimes 24s and 72 off. Every different fire department does a little bit differently. Uh, police department, a lot of them are rotating shifts as well, or they're on permanent midnights, and they're just not getting good sleep. And so this, if you're not getting good sleep, it, it will definitely crush your testosterone levels. Stress, right? I mean, all of those jobs have high degrees of stress uh, in, associated with them. So high degrees of stress and pressure on a regular basis also can, uh, it can influence some of those dips in testosterone. So just from an occupational standpoint, those are some occupational hazards that you just need to be aware of. Um, the good news is, you know, you're not doomed to a fate of, of low testosterone. You guys are already taking steps to mitigate your exposure. Uh, look, when I was on the SWAT team, look, I, I was eating lunch and the guy's like, you know, you should wash your hands before you, uh, before you eat. And I hadn't even thought of that, right? Here's the doctor, you know, hanging out with the cops and, you know, I'm sitting there eating an apple after we just did a you know, morning of shooting at the range and I was probably saturated with lead. And so that's one of these things that a lot of it is awareness. So you, you bring up a good point about awareness, right? And, and I would, again, I don't want to peg ourselves just to first responders because I know that's where we come from, but I'm sure a lot of our listeners are just other hard chargers that may come from the corporate world or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm making an assumption now, but I would say that most of us do want to take care of ourselves, which is why we're listening to this podcast to begin with and, and part of this community. 
Um, so we probably work out. We probably try to mit mitigate uh, stress to whatever extent we can. So what are uh, some steps that we can take to enhance health? And, and obviously, putting aside for a second, going and visiting your practice, uh, which everybody should do and get a baseline number and know where they are. But, you know, for, for the regular Joe Schmo out there, what are some routines in the gym that you would recommend? Is CrossFit a good idea? Is it not? You know, uh, what are some supplements? I know you put me on glycine and that seemed to have helped and not Clomid. Uh, so what are some things that you would recommend people uh, can start do just to uh, improve their testosterone levels if they suspect they're low? Right. So that's always one of the first things that I want to engage in before we even think about starting somebody on testosterone. And we'll, we'll sort of talk about what that entails in a little bit. We always want to try to figure out, is there something that we can do? Is there something natural we can do? Is there something that we can change in our behavior? Because this is not just about cops, firemen, and military. Um, I've got a couple guys who are 20-year-olds in my practice now who have low testosterone. And one of them is, you know, uh, actually it's funny because all three of the guys that are in their twenties or early thirties are linemen. They work on the power lines. Okay. So this is not just, this can be anybody. I've got, you know, guys who are high power, you know, businessmen, attorneys, this is anybody. And so the, the rules pretty much are, um, they, they cross all the boundaries. It's not just, it's not just folks who are in, in those professions that I mentioned. So what can you do to sort of keep your testosterone levels healthy and avoid having to go on testosterone if possible. Well, for starters, we talked about sleep. Sleep is one of these things. I think when we were all younger, we probably all muttered the phrase, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? It wasn't important to us. We all said that at one point or another. And you can get away with that when you're in your early 20s. You can do pretty much anything you want. The problem is that that catches up with you. And as a, you know, as a country, as a species, we, we're generally not getting anywhere near the amount of sleep that we need. So seven and a half to eight and a half hours a night is sort of the gold standard. Uh, sort of respecting your circadian rhythms, going to sleep when it's dark, listening to your body, uh, staying away from electronics before you go to bed because that's going to help you get a, a better night of sleep. It doesn't lead to a busy brain, allows your brain to produce melatonin. Um, we could do a whole talk just on sleep, but just doing things to sort of just get your sleep as optimal as possible and respect it. Like realize that you need sleep because uh, if you're not sleeping well, just nothing else tends to work very well. And over time, your body can't heal and, um, and improve if you're not sleeping well. So sleep is kind of number one. Mitigating stress, all right? Everybody is under stress. I don't care what job you're in. I don't care what your profession is. I, there's not one patient that I've ever asked, are you under a lot of stress? I'm like, oh no, life's great. I've got no stress in my life. I'm like nobody says that because we're all stressed. We all have busy lives. We've got families, obligations. So there's nothing you can do about that. Like if you're, you know, if you have, if you have a stressful profession, short of leaving it, Right. There's not much you can do if if you're you know, if you're an attorney that's working for a high pressure law firm or you're a cop going out and, you know, working in a dangerous area of the city. It doesn't matter. Every one of us has a stressor. What's important is how we mitigate the stress, how we deal with it. OK, because we're all going to have stress. So how can you mitigate it? Well, a lot of it is how you interpret it, how, what you do to sort of release that stress. Exercise is going to be crucial for that. You can, um, you know, ec whatever exercise you want to mitigate stress, that's what works for you. Okay. Whether it's run, you know, cardio, lifting weights, CrossFit, if it's something you enjoy, it's going to help you to mitigate that stress. Yoga. Okay. Yoga is something that is very relaxing, helps out with, um, reducing stress. Uh, it's a pretty good workout. You know, if you're you know, good for stretching, good for musculature. So I, I certainly encourage that for folks. Meditation is another big one. Um, just about every time I mention this to, certainly to, to the police community and to first responders, I always get like a roll of the eyes with the meditation thing. But I got to tell you, like when people give it a chance, a legitimate chance, it's, not, it's really not woo woo. It's, uh, it's the reason I recommend it. Number one, it's free. Uh, it doesn't take long. There's, you know, there's, there's a million apps on your phone that you can get. I like Calm, but you could use Headspace, Insight Timer. There's so many free ones that are out there. Just get a free one and learn how to meditate. It's uh, funny, doctor, that you said that. I just read an article in a police uh, correspondence magazine um, in Canada. They're actually doing meditation before roll call in police departments now uh, because of the, you know, the, the benefits of it and the calming uh, for reducing stress, et cetera. And it's actually correlating in a more, um, you know, de-escalated response in their in their police work. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that because it's something that's becoming a, a phenomenon almost in other countries. And hopefully it'll start, uh, you know, uh, happening here as well, because um, I've just recently got into meditation myself and uh, it definitely helps. 
We Sorry, I'll let meditate. you continue. We've been uh, taught how to meditate in the military and actually in the context of the time, it was part of our SEER school um, as means to kind of be able to mentally resist uh, some of the, the tortures and interrogation techniques used upon us. So uh, I've been meditating on and off. I'm not as consistent as I should be since the uh, early 90s. Uh, and it's probably my primary means, aside from taking only basil, uh, my primary means of uh, calming down my brain. No, that's I'm, awesome. I'm sorry. And I think one thing, too, there's a misconception with meditation, kind of like what you um, let on there, doctor, that you have to sit down and, you know, cross your legs, no mistake for an hour kind of thing. And and it, there's so many different ways to meditate to, to really uh, uh, bring your stress down um, from two minute variations to one hour variations. And I think it's important that um, men know that, you know, because it's always a taboo when it comes to certain things like that, especially those of us who are double, triple type A personalities and just want to kick down doors and think it's, you know, it's not for us. Um, it definitely is something that helps, especially when it comes to functional fitness and health. Yeah, no, th there's no doubt about it. Because the thing is, the first thing people think about is exactly what you said. It's this woo woo stuff and it's, you know, or it's religious. There's a big misconception about what it actually is. And honestly, like the most common ones, you can do them for five or 10 minutes. They don't take a lot of time. Um, when we were, um, when we used to conduct raids and I was in the Bearcat, one of the things I would do is box breathing. I'd read about it in a book on, uh, from a Navy SEAL. Yep, I'm a box breather. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and box breathing brings your heart rate down because you know what it's like. You're ready to you're ready to run out of the you know the, the bearcat to approach the house and you're on a you know raid or on a, a search warrant. And what it does is it just helps to really it brings your heart rate down. Um, it helps on the range, like when you're doing a qual uh, before you know trying to trying to shoot because your heart rate just may be pounding because you're just excited or nervous or whatever. And it's something that really can help focus. And also visualization is another thing you can just mm -hmm. sort of visualize the mission and it it, it can be very centering. But for folks who are not on, on any of those types of deployments, just doing a simple meditation. You can do it first thing in the morning before you go to bed. And what it, and it's been medically shown if, if you do it uh, consistently with any other habit, they've done like PET scans in, uh, of the brain and it's actually changed the architecture of the brain in a, in a positive way. So that's something from a stress mitigation standpoint is important. Um, having healthy relationships, all right, socializing with folks. Uh, what do the, the, the Norwegians call it? You know, huge, uh, you know, the, the, the whole thing of just like hanging out with people, uh, you know, having having good food, uh, you know, adult beverages, things like that. And, and, and sort of experiencing, you know, the best of life and having good relationships will also help to mitigate that. Vikings always got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say having a few adult drinks, is there a limit? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Down the rabbit hole, Alice. Yeah, alcohol can definitely crush it, crush your testosterone if you're putting too much down. I mean, it's like anything, you know, as men, we get off a little bit easier than the women. We, medically speaking, we can get away with one to two drinks a night and it's actually pretty healthy for us. Now, what kind of drinks? Okay, so, you know, beer is generally not as good, just high carbohydrate, you know, wheat based, you know, not nearly as healthy, uh, you know, spirits like bourbon. Uh, you know, good wine full of polyphenols, not uh, high in sugar. Those are the kinds of things that we can get away with that actually lower our risk of cardiovascular disease and improve uh, liver function because it's a, it, essentially alcohol is a toxin. And so a little bit of a toxin taxes your system in a way that's very healthy and, uh, and can have positive effects. So one or two a day for men is, um, is safe and it won't do anything for well, Let me go get my wife so she could hear this real quick. <laughs> women are different. Women only, women unfortunately. <laughs> Not for they, her, for me. <laughs> <laughs> women lose in this category. They can only have three to five a week. Anything more than that increases their risk of breast cancer. So you see, we get lucky yet again. So, okay. um, so I think that that pretty much, you know, just from a, a, and other lifestyle things you can do. Uh, I know you guys will like this one, but eating red meat. Eating red meat increases natural levels of testosterone. So, uh, so folks who are not eating a lot of it or vegetarians can see a dip. Can I pause you there for a second, doctor, and get a, a professional um, opinion? I have a question here. So, one of the things I kind of, and this is sticking to the whole red meat you just said, because obviously it's a benefit for testosterone. Now, um, I've, uh, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't. My PhD is not like yours. It's a public high school diploma. You know, my my associate's degree is in military history. You know, I could put band aids on people. I'm a tac medic. That's about it. Um, 
So I read a book, um, you know, eating right for your blood type. And one of the things it said for me was not to eat red meat, you know, to stick to chickens, turkeys, et cetera, things like that. Seasonal food, fruits and nuts, because I'm uh, primarily um, Native American, et cetera. So eating along those lines. Um, just, I just want your professional opinion based on that on me. You know, I, I don't know if you understand that um, science or concept behind it. I certainly don't. You know, I refer to experts like yourself, but I would love to eat red meat. You know, I'm, I'm like a barbarian like BK. You know, I want to shove meat in my mouth. But I do notice that um, um, it affects my gut and that has, you know, you know, uh, underlying effects as well when it comes to the rest of my health. So I just want to kind of pick your brain on that real quick and not, yeah. not lose track of what we were saying. Yeah, no. So look, I mean, in the end, your body is going to tell you everything that you need to know about what to eat. Okay. And just in how, how you feel afterwards. So eating red meat is clearly not going to be for everybody. There are some people who don't tolerate it. Some people who get indigestion, some people get stomach upset. And so the reality is, is that you know, you don't, when you're looking at testosterone, it's not really just about testosterone. It's about your health, your health in total. And so if you're somebody who you eat red meat and it just doesn't agree with you, then, then that's, then that's just not going to be your thing. The whole blood type thing. It's interesting. Um, I, I've never really delved really deep into it. I have, I've had a lot of patients who I've talked to about it because they've come to me, told me a particular blood type. Like I can tell you my wife's blood type, you know, is, uh, is consistent with being a carnivore. She just loves the meat. Is it consistent across everyone? I, I don't know. I don't. I can't say that I've ever done enough research to say that, that there's any science behind it. But that being said, if you're somebody who it doesn't agree with, then you don't have to push that as a strategy. I mean, but if you're somebody who likes red meat and you're thinking, oh, red meat is bad for me because you you know heard it on the news or whatnot, most of that stuff unfortunately is not true. There's a great book. It's called uh, The Big Fat Lie uh, by Nina. I can't remember her last name, but it's it's a great book on on meat and how we sort of been uh, uh, fed a little bit of uh, a bowl full of lies from the media over the years for a number of reasons. But you don't have to be scared of meat. It should be good quality meat, grass fed, grass finished, organic if, if possible. It's when you're starting to eat the processed meats or the, the meat from cows that are, led in, that are uh, fed in these big uh, grain uh, uh, confined animal feedlots. Those are the ones that, are, that the meat tends to be inflammatory and create some issues with regards to heart disease. So don't worry if you can't eat red meat and you're worried about doing things for your testosterone, it's okay. That's just one of many tools that you can use to boost it. And if it doesn't agree with you, don't force the issue. Yeah, well, so maybe, just, just to sum it up, listen to your body. Listen to your body, honestly. I mean, you know, and people with these blood types, they may find that their body is telling them everything that they need. And if you find, you know, there's no like one diet that's right for everyone. Some folks do great on vegetarian. Some guys do good on carnivore. Some do paleo. Everybody's a little different. Um, there's very few wrong, you know, wrong, uh, lifestyle choices to, to make when you pick one of those healthier choices, you just generally want to stay away from processed foods, things that are high in sugar, fried foods, um, you know, eat as many vegetables as you can in a day. So, so know, basically that's everything a Puerto Rican eats fried food, highs in sugar. So in other hey, words, no. give up my heritage and ethnicity. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. BK, have you looked into getting another partner for this podcast? Because he may not make it past episode five. Yeah, yeah, probably I'm, I'm won't. To drop dead and can... <laughs> That's where I'm going to see you on Wednesday, so I can survive. You better get you better get to my office quick so we can keep you on life support. <laughs> so, Eric, let's take it a step further. So we we just spoke about some some basic things that everybody can do from meditation to working out and and basic mm -hmm. nutrition. Between that and testosterone replacement, they're all gamut in the middle of supplements, I would say, that people mm -hmm. can take uh, to enhance that. So I know you and I had this discussion recently, but I, I'm taking a lot of pills right now. And, and some of them I probably should have been doing for a while, such as uh, some essential fatty acids, right? We're talking about um, taking a good multivitamin, vitamin D, zinc, stuff like that. But there's some that I've never heard of before until I met you. And I mentioned before glycine and one that is a prescription one, Clomid, which I'm not really sure what that is, but that seems to help a lot. Uh, so what are some of those supplements that you would recommend for people that uh, need to take the testosterone up but are still worried about getting on actual testosterone replacement therapy? Sure. Uh, and let me just finish. Before I hit that, I'll just finish. The one last thing you can do is lifting heavy things. Okay. So if you're not going to eat red meat and you, you want to figure out something else you can do to raise your testosterone, you asked about CrossFit. 
Um, you know, as far as uh, raising testosterone levels, uh, two other things, just lifting heavy things. So going to the gym, um, lifting whatever's heavy that you can handle. Obviously, don't go beyond your what you're comfortable with, but lifting something heavy on a regular basis will actually naturally raise your testosterone levels. And that's uh, very different than cardio. So just doing straight up cardio will not raise testosterone levels reliably. So make sure that there is some weightlifting mixed into your, your workout routine. And the other thing is sex. You forgot to mention that. Um, the more sex you have, the more testosterone you produce. So if you don't, my wife again real quick, hold on. <laughs> get her in here. She's missing out on everything. <laughs> so the more, the more you use it, you know, that, you know, you got to use it or you lose it. So those are two other things just from a natural standpoint. Um, supplements. All right. So to, to be perfectly frank, there's not really a lot of supplements that are out there that can naturally raise testosterone. So if you go on the internet um, and a lot of my patients come in, they'll come in on these like testosterone boosters. I haven't found that any of them reliably seem to do a good job of it. If they did, I mean, I'd have them in my practice, but I'm just not really finding it. Um, generally what I want to do when it comes to testicular health, and if you improve testicular health, you have a better chance of getting your testosterone to, to be increased from a natural standpoint. So there are a couple of minerals that do work for that. So zinc is one of them. Selenium is another boron is another. So those have sort of been medically shown to improve testicular health. So if you, if you're taking a good multivitamin, generally you'll get you can get most of those in there in quantities that are sufficient to support testicular health. But as far as, you know, stuff that you're seeing on the internet, I haven't really found that any of those are really game changers when it comes to naturally increasing testosterone. If you're, you know, if you're a young guy and you, you sort of take to heart some of those things, you know, in, increasing your red meat consumption, lifting heavy things, more sex, mitigating stress, improving sleep, you can reliably increase your testosterone levels. Uh, if you're, if you're healthy, it works, to a certain extent when, you know, it works a little bit better, the younger you are, as you get older, you have to, you have to really tighten those things down in order to sort of see an improvement. Um, it's funny. One of the things that I remember your report when I was speaking over your shoulder on my, uh, my chart, uh, it said, uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries and, uh, testicular, testicular, uh, trauma. <laughs> Those are two things. I'm like, actually times fast. So, well, those are, both of those will affect testosterone level, right? If I got kicked in the balls a lot and being around explosions a lot, uh, that would factor in. Right. And so th that's when I'm talking to, to guys and I'm trying to figure out why it is their testosterone might be low, especially if they're young. In my, in my questionnaire, I'm asking them, have you had any traumatic head injuries? And that doesn't have to just be the military. That could be martial arts. It could be playing football when you were in high school. It could be... You know, yesterday I, I was talking to a guy who said he had two concussions when he was eight and 10, um, like falling off his bike and off of a skateboard. I mean, these can be just, you know, regular run of the mill things. And when your brain takes a hit, when there's a significant brain injury, usually in the form of a concussion or some sort of traumatic, traumatic hit to the skull. Um, and this is, you know, anything from sports injuries to folks who are breachers in the military, uh, repeated concussions to the brain, even micro concussions can cause problems with what's called the hypo pituitary, the hypothalamic pituitary axis or the HPA axis. It's a big fancy medical term for a part of your brain that is going to secrete a hormone that gives feedback to your testicles. So your brain secretes something called luteinizing hormone or LH. That's a signal that goes down to the testicles and says, Hey, turn on, you know, start producing some more testosterone. And in the testicles, there are things called Leydig cells. Those are the cells that actually will produce testosterone. And so that luteinizing hormone will cause the testicles to sort of grow in size, grow those cells and produce more testosterone. If you have traumatic brain injury, it can interrupt that cycle. And so what will happen is, is that it's a short circuit in essence. And that's, that's one of the reasons why a guy in their 30s may have low testosterone. Their testicles may be working just fine, but because the brain has been injured, uh, for one reason or the other, they're not producing that hormone and the testicles are not uh, producing testosterone. If you've got testicular trauma, completely different story. With those, you know, with that, it's it's actually physical damage to the testicles and then they can't produce testosterone. That's a little bit of a different uh, animal altogether. So if the testicles can produce anything, there's a chance of turning them back on. But we always, I always like to ask guys, you know, are those things that you've suffered through? So I got a question for you, Doc. Sorry, BK. Go now, again, I just hit all them check marks. So I'm really concerned now, especially for my <laughs> testicles. Um, Sorry. Does a vasectomy have any adverse effects? 
to testosterone because it's something I'm considering now. You know, I'm I'm on the verge of a platoon as far as kids are concerned, and I don't want a division, so um, <laughs> I'm thinking about getting a vasectomy. Uh-huh. Um, how does that adversely or positively or in any way affect testosterone? Luckily, um, shouldn't do anything to it. So you're, you're basically clipping something called the vas deferens, which is where the sperm travels to come out. So it shouldn't have any direct effect on the testicles and, and would not reduce your testosterone levels. Good to know. Cool. So, so Doc, so let's, uh, let's kind of switch gears and talk about uh, testosterone hormonal therapy. Uh, it's one thing that you and I discussed in the past. And at the time, I was still in the process of wanting to have at least one more child. So we... We stop that because one of the things you told me is once you get on it, uh, first of all, your body stops producing its own t- testosterone. So you're done with that. No more kids. And once you're on it, you're on it for life, right? You you shut down your body's natural ability to do it. So you now became dependent on it. So who is it right for? Who is it not? And what are some different therapy options that are out there? Great, great question. So um, to sort of so the first thing that I'd always want to do is say, all right, is there a reversible reason? why your testosterone level is low or suboptimal. Is there something that we can do about it naturally? We went through all of that. Um, If you're somebody who may have been exposed to heavy metals, we would want to do heavy metals testing on you to see if that's something that's, that's factoring into this. So, um, you know, again, this is not just firemen, cops and military. Like I said, I've got three guys who are linemen in my service in that work on high power lines. So there's a lot of lead in high power lines. I've got a painter, that's in my practice, who's been exposed to, um, you know, heavy metals from paints, you know, from, from, so you can get this in all walks of life. There are different ways this this can happen. I actually just tested a nurse two weeks ago who used to work on a chemotherapy floor and she's got very high mercury. Okay. From the chemotherapeutic agents. So it's, um, you know, this, this is something that if you worked in a profession or you have a hobby or something where you could have exposed to this, we would want to explore that as an option. And if that's the case and we're able to get the heavy metals out of your system, sometimes your testosterone can rebound um, as well naturally. If we've gone through all those options and, you know, you either it doesn't fit or we tried it and it isn't working, then we have to think about ways that we can get your testosterone level up. So you had mentioned Clomid and that was, you know, like you had mentioned, that was one of the things that you and I had utilized as a first tool for you. Clomid is something called a selective estrogen receptor modulator or CIRM. It's a big fancy term for what it does is it has an, imp- an influence on the brain to help it to produce more luteinizing hormone, the hormone that we just talked about, to go down and get your testicles to turn back on. When we give somebody Clomid, you guys, you know, people may have heard of Clomid. They're like, wait a second, isn't that the drug that you give woman, a woman to, you know, get increase her fertility? And that's actually what it does for women. When you give it to a woman, it increases the egg count in her ovaries. But for men, it will stimulate luteinizing hormone so that it turns the testicles back on. That and then- so much. I've been lactating, no stop. Wow, you know, you're, you're serving double duty now. <laughs> I like milking my coffee. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric, keep going. I had to, I had to jump in. <laughs> I had to say it. So um, long story short, if, if a man goes to the pharmacy and a pharmacist says, wait a second, this is something for a woman, I, I want guys to understand why we utilize something like this because I have actually had pharmacists that called the office and said, what are you giving to the guy for? Because it's a fertility drug, but it actually has use for both men and women. So with Clomid, what I find is, you know, uh, probably about 10 to 20% of guys will not respond to it. And we're talking the younger and healthier you are, the greater your chance of responding. But you know, about 10 or 20% you know, won't respond. About 10, 20% may have some side effects like changes in mood or changes in color vision, headaches. You can get some minor things. If you stop the Clomid, those symptoms go away. But in, in younger guys, this is a pretty darn good way to get the testosterone levels up without committing them to testosterone replacement therapy for the rest of their life. And the game plan with it is usually I'll put, put a guy on it for like a year to 18 months, and then we take you off of it and see if you can fly on your own. And sometimes what it does is it sort of kickstarts the brain into producing the hormones that it needs on its own. Uh, and then, you know, with healthy testicles and with getting that, you know, that circuit back going again, uh, a man can sometimes fly on his own without having to worry about, t- you know, using testosterone replacement therapy. So that's, that's definitely one option. And, uh, you know, good news is, you know, insurance covers it. It's a pill. It's, it's, it's relatively easy. So that usually is like my first sort of advice to guys that are younger and healthier as far as getting things going again. Now, testosterone, all right? Testosterone comes in a lot of flavors, a lot of ways to give it some things to sort of just broad brushes. 
once you start testosterone, guys are always like, well, how long do I have to be on this for? Is this like forever? And my answer is always the same. It's as long as you want to be on it. You can be on it until the day you die. You can stop it a week from now. Um, essentially, if you stop the testosterone and you got benefits from it, any benefits that you get from the testosterone go away once you stop using it. So it's one of these things that uh, if a guy decides he doesn't want to use it in 10 years and he had a lot of you know improvement in his energy and his vitality and his drive and his mood and his sex life, many of those things will sort of go away if he stops the testosterone. So uh, I always like guys to understand that this is going to be perhaps a lifelong commitment. Um, additionally, I want to make sure that a man has no desire to have children because testosterone, once you know your testicles, they've got two jobs, right? Job number one is produce testosterone. Job number two, produce sperm. When you give a man testosterone, the testicles sense that testosterone and say, whoa, okay, things are pretty good around here. I can like lay off of work and just take it easy. And they stop producing testosterone. And also they shut down their sperm production. So they basically go to sleep. They don't shrivel away to nothing, uh, but they just stop functioning because they're, they're feeling, basically it's a feedback loop and they realize that the job is being done well. They don't have to do very much. So, um, once a guy starts testosterone replacement therapy, there is the chance that it can make them sterile. So I always want them to know that in advance. There's, you know, that there's no guarantees. Now, with, with a lot of guys, if we stop it, there is a chance they can come back and bring their sperm production back up. We have a couple ways to do that. But, you know, you never know. And it could be a permanent thing. So I always let them know. So they have to be in a position where they're either going to bank sperm because they're thinking about having kids in the future or, you know, they've made the decision with their significant other that, hey, you know, they're not going to go down that route. Is it um, a valid birth control method? Say again? Is it a valid birth control method? <sighs> you know, I can think of a lot of other ones that are a lot easier, less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't saying, realize I'm testicles gonna... could be so lazy. <laughs> if, they're lazy. If I get on it anyways, right? If I, let's say if I chose to go on a testosterone or more therapy, right? I give myself the shot every week or whatever, right? And as, as you mentioned, my, my testicles stop producing on their own uh, sperm and testosterone. Does my significant other have to be on birth control as well? Yeah, I would say, you know, that it's definitely not a guarantee. And I would certainly not utilize it as a sole means of birth control because like anything, look, even vasectomies aren't 100%, right? So I would say that, no, I probably would not utilize that as my sole means of birth control. And I would, I would add to that, if your semen has the same personality as you, it's probably <laughs> going to find a way. So <laughs> there. there you go. There hey, you go. Quick, quick question, Nate, uh, Doc, since we're coming to the end here, um, kind of deviate from the medical portion of this, because I'm sure some people are concerned. Now, I would assume coming to see you, you would be considered a specialist. I brought it up to my primary care physician, and her response was always, if you feel you need to see one, go ahead and see one. She would never refer it. Um, is this something that most um, major or pseudo major medical insurance covers as far as seeing you or is, do you see, is it more of a private thing that would be more of an expense to the individual? Yeah, great question. So, you know, the, the insurance model is not one of wellness care, as you can imagine, it's really a sickness care model. Right. And so with functional medicine, it's a very different experience. Like when you come in, the first visit's an hour. And if you think about when's the last time you spent an hour with any of your doctors, you can't like, if you're lucky five or six minutes, because that's all the doctors got time for the way the insurance company has set it up with their reimbursement. They're not getting paid a lot. So they've got to just barrel through the patients. It's, it's not really the doctor's fault per se. They're just you know, trying to make a living. And with what the insurance is reimbursing, they, they can't spend much time with you. So, um, so in my practice, it's, it is uh, not covered by insurance. What I do is I give everybody a super bill with diagnosis codes on it. And I, and I, uh, I recommend that you submit that to your ins insurance company with the hope of getting reimbursed at least for a portion of it. I never promise anything because, you know, with insurance companies, they're funny. You just never know. But the gist of it is um, I'm sort of like an out-of-network provider. And so a lot of folks, uh, you know, can submit and get something back. Many do not. Uh, but, you know, in, in the end, it's sort of like, uh, you know, you're, you're investing in your health. Correct. And that's what it comes down to. A lot of people who are used to getting everything for free with insurance it's um, it's a little bit of a, of a different model and it takes them sort of it takes a little bit of getting your mind around it. But I think most of the patients, if not all of my patients that come are refreshed by the experience that somebody finally has a chance to sit down and listen to them. And, and nobody's listened to them before. And you get a chance to actually 
know the patient and form a relationship with them. So it's a very, very different experience than the typical model. Absolutely. And I know BK can speak empirically for that as far as the, you know, the endo and, and the chronologist side, you know, as hormones. And I can speak for the physical therapy side, you know, as I mentioned before with Resilient, um, which I know you're affiliated with, which I had no idea until I saw your name on the glass when I walked in. Um, but I had a bad experience with traditional certified physical therapists. You know, I've had multiple back surgeries, knee surgeries. Um, I met the staff at a fundraiser and um, I spent an hour with an actual doctor working on my injuries and with different methods. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. And I wish I would have done it sooner uh, when it came to that functional fitness. So, uh, you know, I, I anyone who's listening, you know, I implore you, it's definitely worth the investment in your own body, um, especially as you're getting older in age. And sorry, BK, I know you were about to say something. No, that's fine. I just want to circle back before we completely get out of the topic. I know you have some closing questions. For oh, us. yeah. But, Fun with uh, Dr. Nager hour. Hit me. Uh, hold on, hold on. Before that, so before we finish talking about the testosterone or hormonal therapy, yeah. right, uh, what are some options out there uh, as far as that therapy? Because I know there's shots, there's patches, yep. there's all kind of stuff, pros and cons. Okay. So the there it comes in a couple different flavors. The first way is a cream. Uh, that's what most men have probably gotten from their primary care doctors. Because again, in medical school, we learn virtually nothing about testosterone. Um, your primary care doctor usually feels very uncomfortable with, you know, hormone replacement therapy. They'll sometimes give you something called androgel, which um, is what a lot of guys, their first experience with testosterone is. Unfortunately, it's, it's very, um, it's not well absorbed. The gel carrier that it's in is awful. It does not allow the testosterone to penetrate very well. And it's a very dilute concentration of testosterone. So most guys don't get really much of a benefit from that. Um, if you're going to go with a cream, transdermal creams made by a compounding pharmacist is sort of the most effective way to get the testosterone into the system. Uh, it's the least invasive of all the ways. And it's, um, it's uh, something that a lot of guys will sort of start with. It's about 50-50 whether you respond to that. It's about 50% effective with most guys. Second option is injections. Injections seem to be the most popular route that most guys take. Uh, injections can be either in the form of an intramuscular, like into the muscle, like the deltoid or your thigh or subcutaneous, like into your belly. Uh, and the injections range, you know, the old school way was you got it once every one to two weeks. Uh, in my practice, I recommend doing it three times a week because it keeps much steadier state levels. As long as you don't mind a needle and the, and the little subcutaneous ones are not bad. You do it three times a week and it keeps very steady state levels and it enables you to give the patient a smaller dose of testosterone. Uh, so less side effects and less problems. Uh, the third way is a pellet. A pellet is a compressed amount of testosterone into the size of a grain of rice. And we do a procedure in the office where we numb up uh, an area on the side of your hip and the buttock area. We make a small incision. We put the pellet underneath the skin, and then we close it up with some butterfly strips. And uh, aside from, you know, just three days of not working out, uh, the nice thing about that is it lasts for about three or four months. So it's sort of fire and forget a lot more convenient. The patches, they, they don't, nobody really uses the patches much. They're very expensive and many times insurance companies don't cover them. So it's not an option that a lot of folks will pursue. Uh, and I lay out the options to every guy and I sort of let them choose whatever, you know, everybody sort of has a motivation about what one of those methods will appeal to them. I kind of let them choose and then we sort of go from there. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, any last comments or last thoughts to, uh, to our listeners about what they should, should not do. And if you don't mind giving the contact info for your practice, we'll also make sure to add it to the show's not notes so people can reach it later. Sure. So I would say, you know, if you feel like something is not right with your body and you've been to your doctor and your doctor's telling, you no, everything's fine. You just need an antidepressant or you just need this pill or, you know, before you go down that route and you blow off the symptoms that you know something is wrong, try to investigate it, right? Go, go to, you know, if it's not me, find the functional medicine physician that can help you because we're trained in sort of looking for the root cause of illness. And that might be hormones. It might be your thyroid. It might be your gut. It might be your sleep. There's a lot of different things it could be, but don't just brush it off because, you know, the longer you wait, unfortunately, it's like, you know, snow, it's like a snowball ro rolling downhill. It just, the problem gets out of control. So I would say make sure you take care of yourself, invest in your health. There's really no better investment. We all sort of laughed about that, right? When we were in our 20s, at least I've got my health. You know, we'd make fun of our grandparents. But the reality is, is that, you know, we're not in our early 20s anymore. And we really have to pay close attention to our bodies so that we can live the healthiest, most enjoyable life as long as we can. 
Um, and then just about myself. So my practice is Opti Health Institute. Uh, I'm located in uh, Baltimore County in Maryland. Uh, BK, you can put the phone number and the, the website in the show notes. If people want to contact me, you can find me on the web, uh, optihealthinstitutemd.com. And uh, we're accepting new patients. So all you have to do is give us a call and I'd love to meet you. Was it optihealthinstitutemd.com? Correct. Hey, I reserve one of those spots now. Just you got it, man. <laughs> awesome. That. All right. I'm all, right. Sure to all right. So, Steve. Doc, all right. So one of my passions all right, um, is mental health, uh, specifically bringing awareness for PTSD, suicide prevention. But that being said, mental health in general. And as we get older, our mind might wander a bit. So we're going to have a fun little trivia uh, uh, question challenge for you. All right. I, like yourself, am from Brooklyn, New York. All right. Born and raised in Bushwick, you know, the former Dutch village of uh, Brooklyn. All right. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Let's see how well you do, Dr. Nager. Okay. And just to be fair, my, my degree is in history, so I have a little advantage here. All right. But first and foremost, I want to start with, do you, do you, do you like hot dogs? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. But when, when you were in New York, what was your perfect dirty water corner stand hot dog? Nathan's. All right. What'd you put on it, though? What mustard, was your mustard sauerkraut? Mustard and sauerkraut. Okay. I was more of a ketchup and cooked onions. Oh, All right. okay. <laughs> your first question. Your first question. All right. New York City economist. When they refer to the pizza principle, what are they referring to? And mind you, the first New York City pizzeria came in the 1800s. I believe it was 1895. But when they refer to the pizza principle, what are they referring to? And I actually learned this in high school. The pizza principle. And this is not raised pizza we're talking about. There's a lot nope. of imposters. You got no, this is, think economy. This is this is an actual economist term. I've never, I've never heard this before. All right. So all right, that's one down. So okay. the theory is that the ride on the New York City subway system is always equal to and or just close to the slice of pizza in New York. The prices rise together. That is the pizza principle. Wow. Okay. All right. One now. <laughs> All right. So we're getting every day to school. Go ahead. <laughs> Coney Island. All right. Iconic Brooklyn symbol. All right. The Wonder Wheel is known as the most what ride in the world. The one. You know, uh, huh. the, you know what movie The Wonder Wheel appeared in? Many. Uh, you got The Warriors. Warriors. There you go. Hold, hold that <laughs> off. All right. The Warriors, my <laughs> favorite movie ever. <laughs> the Warriors is definitely the greatest movie ever made. And I went to the, um, the, they had a Warriors reunion in Coney Island in 2018. And uh, so I've got the poster downstairs. I got all, I got dressed up as a fury. It, look, listen, Doc, I still cannot convince BK to watch the movie. Baseball Furies, favorite game. Like I've, I've seen it a thousand times. Okay. Anyway, so. One on Netflix. Hold on. It was on Netflix the other night. I was about to watch it, and I was told by a specific someone uh, not to. Just throwing it out there. We can anyway, talk about it. it is considered <laughs> the most romantic ride. I've never heard that one either. You're all right. Me. The Manhattan right. Bridge. All right. Although everyone's always bl uh, Brooklyn Bridge, blah, blah, blah. The Manhattan Bridge also goes from Brooklyn into New York City or Manhattan, uh, as most people would know it. Its original name was going to be what? Not the Manhattan Bridge. Man, I love stumping doctors. This is fantastic. Well, we've got it wasn't the Williamsburg Bridge because that they no, have really is another bridge. Yeah, no, I get another right track. There's multiple bridges here, and that's yeah. that's a clue to the answer. Hmm. I, obviously, we had this is the Manhattan Bridge. Go ahead, hit me. It was literally going to be named Bridge Number Three. <laughs> okay. Could you imagine going? I'm going there's over three, bridge there's three three. bridges. There's three bridges that go from Brooklyn to New York City. So. You're killing me here. How did I live in New York for 25 years and I know none of this? Listen, okay. Okay. One more question. In my defense, I, I love anthropology. I, I, I love anthropology. I love history. I'm a history major, specifically military history, but I love this stuff. All right, next question for you. Something you carry in your wallet, all right, on a daily basis, use it financially. What is it? It was invented in Brooklyn. I gave you a lot of clues there. The credit card? The wow. credit card. I mean, I was going to say credit card, but it was invented in Brooklyn. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Was it a Jewish person that invented it? More than likely. <laughs> <laughs> what iconic 
This is an easy one. Stuffed animal was created in Brooklyn, New York. The teddy bear. Teddy's bear is the original name. But, yes, the teddy bear. Okay, I got one more. Called, more Steven. Originally called Teddy's bear. All, All right. right. Last but not least. Last but not least. Coney Island. The first American roller coaster was introduced in 1884. What was it called? Cyclone. No. Oh. Not what everyone says. It was the Switchback Railroad. Fantastic. You failed. <laughs> I, I failed miserably. Miserably. At least I, know, at least the, I know the Warriors come from Coney Island. That has to count for something. You know something. what? That trumps all of it. <laughs> the fact that you're a Warriors fan like me. So you're good. You passed. I should have worn my Warriors T-shirt to this. That oh. would have been more apropos. I'll yeah. wear it to the next one. There you go. Uh, yeah. So uh, you you passed. You got the Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm certainly sure that we're going to have a follow up because I, I know people are going to want to ask questions. And Eric, you also have a plethora of other uh, skill sets that I think our listeners would find very uh, very interesting. Anything from uh, preparedness and and the tactical side of medicine and so forth. So I'm looking forward to having you in the future again. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure Steve is going to be knocking on your office door later this yeah, I'll, week. I'll be at Resilient on Wednesday anyway. So Awesome. Those folks are great. No, yes, no, they are. Phenomenal. Yeah, they're, they're in the building. Maddie and, um, and Jordan, they're, just, Jordan. They're, they're awesome. So, yep. Yep, perfect. Well, thank you so much, and have a wonderful day. You guys, thanks. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye.